Me wehi kia i o matua kore, te tīmatanga o te whakaro nui. E tuanau te tahi uri no papatua nuku e takoto nei, tēnā koe te whaia tūpuna. Me whakahonore ki tō tātou kingi, kingi tūheitia, hōtatau te whero-whero te tuawhitu. E noho mai rā e rongi te ahure wataku o tōna whaia ona tūpuna tainoa ki te kahu yari ki nui tonu, pai marire. Ki te hau kāinga, nā te whātua. E heka e, tō manā ki mai ki a tatau, nā mihi nui. Ka hoki maha rā ki ngā hunga mate, huhua o te tau, o te marama, o te wiki, o nai nei, haere atu rā koutou ki te kāpuni puni o te atu ai. Ka hoki mai ki a tatau, nā kanohi ora, nā kanohi koe, e oki oki nei, i rongi tēnei kaupapa whakahira hira, ko te oranga, ko te wairua, ko te whānau, ko te whakapapa, ngā kaupapa matua o tēnei hui. Ai, he uri tēnei nō Waimirirangi, nō Muri Whenua Hau. Ka hoki maharā ki tēnei wahanga o tō mātou whenua, ko Muri Motu te ingoa. Ka hoki mahara ki te tahi o ngā tūpuna, ko tū matahina tonu ingoa. E ai ki aia, nga kuaka mārangaranga, ko tahi manu, tau ki te tahuna, tau atu, tau atu, tau rā. Nei a mihi, ka rere ki a kotau. Kia ora, everybody. I just want to say how, how honoured I feel and how much in awe I am of all of you, of all of you who do, who together we do this really hard work, really, really important work. Thank you so much for inviting me, Dapans, and to all the organisers who've, who've made my short part of this conference so, so easy for me. Thank you so much. I'm going to take you on a, on a whistle-stop tour of what's going on in my head around cannabis as a, as a psychiatrist. So as you've heard, I, um, I'm a child and adolescent psychiatrist. I work at the Starship two or three days a week usually. And I'm also a youth forensic psychiatrist. I write court reports. So I see Tomoriki Mokopuna who uh, come to the attention of the court and I also see uh, our, our rangatahi and sometimes tamariki who have had brain injuries. That was the topic of my PhD and my poster. So, this is a little story that um, I, have, I have written to orientate us to some of the kaupapa that I want to share this afternoon. So, Tama is a 13-year-old mokapuna of Teopauri. He's a student at Kura Kaupapa and he's been wagging school and he's been smoking cannabis. Hine is his auntie and a teacher at the Kura. She's worried about him. He's been acting strangely lately, talking to himself, making no sense sometimes. She wonders, to what extent is cannabis the problem? So I've got a few key areas that I want to cover and I'm going to go quite rapidly because I do want to leave a little bit of time at the end. Kōrero. I'm going to focus on Māori, and there'll be pretty obvious reasons for that. I'm going to talk about um, the evidence as I see it. We can debate this term evidence and what it means and who priorita prioritises what evidence over other evidence, and we will touch on some of those issues. We, we need a lot of wānanga about this stuff, don't we? I'm going to talk about some of the evidence around mental health and cannabis, mental ill health and cannabis. And I'm going to talk about the current harms, because I think we all need to come to grips in, in much more specific detail about what the current harms are, what the status quo means, particularly for Māori. And then I've got some thoughts about the considerations about legalisation and regulation and then I've got a few conclusions. 
So let's get into it. Māori, we are the First Nations people. We have a relationship with the Crown called Te Tiriti o Waitangi. We face ongoing colonisation. Just look at Tuia 250. Just look at Ehu Mātau. Just look at the fact that we've only just heard that our real history is going to be taught in schools by 2022 and what that history might actually look like. And it's 2019. We know, and, I'm, and I know you've heard much about this already, the health and criminal justice inequities for us as Māori are massive. And we've got good evidence about racism, which is pervasive uh, in, in all aspects that you care to try to measure around health, health services, access, and around legal processes. And I thought, just to be clear, let's have a definition of racism right up front, which is belief and action that all members of a certain race or ethnicity possess inferior characteristics. That's what we live. That's what our whānau live every day. So cannabis. Kia matāra whānau. Let's be vigilant. I think, I suppose I wanted to just put on the table that when we talk about cannabis, we're not talking about one thing. We're talking about different kinds of plants. We're talking about hybrid strains. We're talking about a material that can be adulterated with other substances. The quality, uh, you know, has it, has it been in a hole in the ground for six months? Has it been in somebody's attic for a year? Um, what part of the plant is it? What is the potency of it? So I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir for much of this, but just to be clear, cannabis is not one thing. And this is really important when we look at the research. Much of the research that has a lot of weight to it is from longitudinal studies. In particular, two studies that come from here, come from Aotearoa, the Christchurch Health and Development Study and the Dunedin Study. <coughs> And those studies have been going since the mid-70s. And so we know that the, the cannabis that people talk about when they're reporting on their cannabis use at different time points along that journey of the longitudinal studies will be different products. So let's keep that in mind. We also know that um, self-reported use is variable. So for example, when I see some of our rangatahi for court reports, or in youth justice settings, the norm is to kind of um, talk up your use. So we have to be mindful that in other settings, it, the norm is to talk down, to minimize the use. So again, many of our research studies are relying on self-reported measures. And research itself is biased. All research is biased. There is no such thing as some pure research that we can take as gospel. So please remember that because there will no doubt be people who will put research in front of your face and say, see, this research found that. And they will try to shut down a conversation. They will try to say this is the truth and the only truth. And so I want, if there's one take home message from my talk, is be vigilant around critiquing any research at all. Data collection issues. We're talking about trying to do research with an illegal substance. This is a problem. All of these aspects, trying to recruit people into studies is difficult. Um, so this all impacts on the applicability or the generalizability of the findings of that research. And also to remember that Despite these longitudinal studies being so incredibly influential, they actually have a very small proportion of Māori. They are not powered to give us uh, the best quality of information about the Māori experience. So only 12% in the Christchurch Health and Development Study and 11 in the Dunedin Study. So what are some of our current numbers? So this, these um, statements are from Ministry of Health reports which suggest 11% of people aged above 15 use cannabis at least once in the previous 12 months, and that 34% of users had used at least weekly in the last 12 months. By the age of 25, these surveys suggest 80% of New Zealanders have tried cannabis, 
and almost 50% of those aged 16 to 64 had also used it. So there's, there's some mixed data there, but essentially what it's saying is a lot of people have tried cannabis. And I have um, provided some citations with these slides, and I'm very happy for these slides to be made available um, through the conference organisers for any of you. So you don't need to take notes. The Christchurch Health and Development Study looked at their cohort at the age of 25, and what they found was that 85% of cannabis users had not become dependent on cannabis. There are no reported deaths from toxic cannabis overdose. And I draw your attention to comparing to other substances, for example, synthetics. It looks like there are around 50 people who have died because of synthetics since 2017. Between 600 and 800 people in New Zealand die every year from alcohol-related deaths. There's a strong link with violent crime and alcohol. Alcohol use has been found to be a significant factor in attempted and completed suicides in the UK. And we think around 1,800 children are born in New Zealand every year with fetal alcohol syndrome disorder. So this is a very busy slide, but if you just squint at it, you get the, you get the feel. So the top line is alcohol. The purple is harms to the consumer, and the red is harms to others. And so you can see alcohol is at the top. And we come to cannabis. So alcohol gets 72 points on this particular scale. This is a graphic that comes from uh, The Lancet, which is a very prestigious medical journal, and was also reproduced in the Helen Clark Foundation report that recently came out. So alcohol has 72 points. Cannabis has 20 points. So you can see the relative harms of alcohol, and, and other substances. So as a psychiatrist, I wanted to talk about psychosis because that's one of the, that's one of the real hot points I feel around people's concerns around cannabis use and mental ill health. So what is psychosis, first of all? We have, we have lots of confusing terms in psychiatry. We have the term schizophrenia, we have the term first episode psychosis, we have the term schizophreniform disorder. So I don't, I don't want to get into all of that. Suffice to say, psychosis is a severe condition which is characterized by persistent disorganization of thinking and behavior, abnormal perceptual experiences, we might call those auditory or visual hallucinations, other types of hallucinations, and beliefs. And sometimes those beliefs are so extra extraordinarily um, abnormal and they are held against evidence to the contrary that we call them delusions. So, there is an association between cannabis use and psychosis, but the research is, uh, is mixed and it's difficult to tease out some of these other dynamics. So one of the key issues that um, esteemed scholarly colleagues like David Ferguson and his group in the, in the Christchurch study have found is that there, there seems to be a significant component with what they call reverse causality. So what that means is that people who are developing psychotic illnesses use cannabis to try to mitigate those or manage their experience of distress so that the linkage is uh, perhaps going in the other direction. There is some evidence that the more you use it, the greater the risk. And um, if, if you're going to use it at an early age, then there's a certain group of people in, in this study uh, reported by Louise Arsenault, which relates to one of the longitudinal data sets, that around 10% develop what they call schizophreniform disorder by the age of 26. So schizophreniform disorder is essentially a psychotic disorder that lasts a shorter period of time. So there does seem to be this vulnerable group that we know, that we have identified through various um, types of research of about 10%. But 
But I think it's really important to point out that most people that use cannabis do not develop psychosis. And most cases of psychosis are not attributable to cannabis. So that's an important message for people like Auntie Hine and the kura of our, of our young tama that I talked about at the beginning. What about depression? So there's been a, a growing literature looking at the relationship between cannabis and depression. And again, it's mixed. The findings are mixed. There does seem to be an association with the younger age of use and depressive symptoms. But then some other people found that in the earlier age group, in the younger age group, this was not associated or predictive of depression. Some weak association with age is, is the best that the, the current research, the current state of science can offer us. So there's no definitive conclusion also about the direction of causality. So some general comments from other studies that I thought you would be interested in. Um, most cannabis users do not progress to problematic use of cannabis or use of other illegal substances. This has been a, a major concern. Also, this idea of cannabis being a gateway substance. I think we now know that that whole way of conceptualizing cannabis has, has not been borne out by the more recent research. There's also some mixed findings about cognitive functioning and its effects. So, some studies found that um, there might have been an overstatement about the impact on cognitive functioning, not just in terms of the statistical impact, but cognitive functioning in the real world. However, um, using the Dunedin data, a group from the States analyzed some of that material, and what they found when they followed up over 20 years, that there was a loss of IQ points in people who they'd assessed at the age of 13, prior to any use of cannabis, and they followed up from the age of 18. So they, fo they found from their data set there was some evidence of cognitive functional decline associated with cannabis. We know that the more you smoke cannabis, the more likely it is that you'll have a car accident. And there are some other physical symptoms, so bronchitis, shortness of breath, chest tightness, wheeze, these are all uh, adverse effects of smoking cannabis. There's another body of research about lung cancer and respiratory tract cancer, which is, they, the researchers have found it difficult to tease out the um, collective impacts of tobacco and alcohol and cannabis and to see what, what the relative impacts of those different substances may have, the relative weighting, if you like. So, it's a mixed bag. There is an association with psychosis. The more you use it, the greater your risk. Um, there's some evidence around age of onset of use and depression. In the cognitive um, domain, there is also some evidence of uh, long-term lowering of IQ points, but there's some mixed findings from different types of research. So now I just want to talk about the current law Briefly, I'm sure you've heard from many of my colleagues about the discriminatory framework that we're in right now. And I suppose I want to take us on a, on a slightly different tangent. But just to say we know it's an illegal, unregulated market. There's been a recent amendment to the Misuse of Drugs Act. So there is now no prosecution for possession unless it's in the public interest to do so. That invites a whole lot of um, discretionary um, decision making, does it not? And as Māori, we already know the, ge the general direction that discretionary decision-making takes us in. So the, the implementation of law for Māori is very much in my mind and something I see in my daily practice. So decriminalise for some. And for some groups in our community, I think it's fair to say that they have experienced a sense of decriminalisation for quite some time. But that's not what we experience in the Māori community. So here are some examples from other laws that I think are useful to consider in this context. Three laws, two of which I have a lot to do with and one which is relatively new. The Mental Health Act, uh, Child and Youth and Oranga Tamariki Legislation and Substance Addiction Act from a couple of years ago. So just to show you that in the Mental Health Act, Section 5, 
we have mention of Māori kupu, Māori concepts, whānau, hapu and iwi, that should be um, recognised. The importance and significance of those groups to the person is, is, um, is not a requirement, but it's suggested. It's a principle. There should be proper recognition of the contribution that those uh, linkages, those ties make to the person's well-being, and there's a respect for language, not specific to te reo Māori, but a respect for cultural and ethnic identity and language. Oranga Tamariki Act also talks about the, um, the whānau, hapu and iwi, and here we see a, a must-always-be phrase Consideration must always be given to how a decision affecting a child or young person will affect those groups. And in the Substance Addiction Act, the phrase wherever possible is used. So a lot more flexibility there. It does mention whānau, hapu and iwi. So my concern there is that the uh, Māori concepts within the extant law provide principles or factors to be recognised, but they're not mandated. So there are other parts of those laws which are very vigorously mandated. For example, in the Mental Health Act, you have to give certain people certain pieces of paper at certain times. That is not negotiable. Um, but the, the um, interaction with whānau, hapu and iwi, iwi is negotiable within those different laws. So I think this risks tokenism and inconsistent use. And it also requires a depth of understanding about Māori concepts. Any cannabis legislation and regulatory framework that's designed to provide an authentic approach for Māori, to my way of thinking, must be mindful of that. So I'm coming to some conclusions now. I've given a, a, a taste of the criminal justice sphere, and I'm sure you're all very well aware that the criminal justice cannabis approach results in inequities for Māori. There are barriers in the current approach for, for health, for people who are suffering, at least in part to, to, due to their use of cannabis, to access health treatment support. So. Overall, I think Māori are much worse off in the current situation. And I've illustrated some points from the research literature that give us a rough guide as to the areas where we have some relatively good information about the risks of using cannabis for young people. And young people as they grow older. As I said before, most people who use cannabis do not develop psychotic symptoms, and most cases of psychosis are not attributable to cannabis. There's no clear evidence of causality with depression, and we do have some evidence of cognitive impairment. Um, although most of the literature talks about the brief effect of that during a period of intoxication. So it seems to me that there's this illogical approach to cannabis in the face of the comparative evidence, particularly around the impact of alcohol in our communities. Any new legislation, regulatory framework must be cognizant of a robust requirement to mitigate the risk of tokenism, tokenism as we see it in the current law. The current approach does not prevent use or prevent harm. In fact, it tolerates and perpetuates harm particularly for Māori. I wanted to, I thought a lot about presenting this quote. Many of you will remember Professor Ferguson. He is one of the most influential Pākehā researchers that this country has ever produced in the, in the area pertinent to our discussion. So he led the Christchurch Health and Development Study for many, many years. And I think it's fascinating that Professor Ferguson, that this comes from the Corrections website, said this in 2003. In broad outline, it seems likely that the difficulties and disadvantages faced by contemporary Māori families are likely to represent a long-term historical process that has involved many components, including the pressures faced by and change in Māori culture and language following colonisation, the loss of land and economic power base experienced by Māori, 
increasing urbanisation of Māori and the general reduction of status and prestige, prestige mana of Māori people within the context of New Zealand society. So David Ferguson, who to me is the epitome of uh, Pākehā evidence-based approaches and scholarly research, said this a long time ago on the basis of the evidence from the Christchurch Health and Development Study. So I ponder the fact that as Māori, we are continually told we must make decisions based on evidence. I would like to see Pākehā systems, Pākehā institutions act on the basis of their own evidence that they've had for many, many years. So in regard to our young boy, Tama, and mindful of what Professor Ferguson said, yes, cannabis can be part of the problem, but it's not the sole driver of problems, and maintaining the current environment maintains the problems that we have. Nā mihi nui, kia koutou katoa. Happy to take questions. Really, I'm not that scary. <laughs> Kia ora. Kia ora, Stephen. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And I suppose I, I wanted to focus my talk today on, on us being really clear about the status quo. Because I think if we really get to know the status quo that we're in, it will help us to make better decisions next year when we are facing the referendum. We know that there are at least 50,000 people in the New Zealand community right now who do not have access to support, to treatment for their um, substance abuse problems. So um, I agree with you, it, it is about what we, what we do with those issues. But one of the things I've learned is that there are other levers that get pulled. So, so for some people, for some of our decision makers, they put an incredible amount of weight on research findings. And research findings can take on a life of their own. So um, it's a bit like, in a practical sense, when I'm working in the court arena and there is a cognitive assessment done about a young person. And that cognitive assessment, just based on the numbers, might give the impression that that person has some intellectual impairment. But actually, and so in the court, numbers are very powerful. One of the important parts of my job is to help the court deconstruct those numbers because we don't treat numbers, we treat people. We look after people. So, so those assessments, those assessment tools are developed in the UK and in the US and they are not validated for Māori, they are not validated for Pacific people and so they can give a really false impression of, of what is going on for that particular young person within a whānau context. So uh, I think we, whether we like it or not, have to get, have to get, our, get to grips with 
this um, incredibly influential part of the debate and the discussion, which is research findings, which is why I put all that stuff up earlier on about like, examine research, examine research design, who were the participants, what, who, where were the Māori participants, where were the Pacifica participants, what sort of parts of the community were they drawing from? Because, you know, Aotearoa has, has a lot of variability in terms of our different graphics around the country. You know, those of us from the far north know full well that uh, many of my whānau are living in, in a state of poverty, impov impoverishment of mind and of spirit and of material possessions that is, um, frankly, just completely unacceptable and intolerable. And many, and many Pākehā people in our country have never seen it and, they, and they're not confronted with it, so they kind of don't believe it exists. So I, I invite you, I encourage you, amongst yourselves and your teams and your communities, with your, with your consumers, your patients, your whānau, whatever names you, they prefer, you prefer, is to um, deconstruct this very powerful element which is going to influence people's thinking and our politicians' thinking, which is the research that um, some, of the, some of these numbers are drawn from. Neha. Any other thoughts or questions? Oh, that's right, I've got the... Got the <laughs> <myth>. <laughs> How does that sound? That I'm tired. Ooh, yeah, I'm taking this home. No. <laughs> now, mihau te kia koe, hini mō pai o whakaro rangatira, uh, ki te whakawāte, te hurahi, uh, i, i ki raro i te kaupapa o statistics me, me research. Uh, I really like the fact that, um, uh, that you are giving a message of be really, vigil be really mindful of what mm. you're looking at and be mindful of context. And I had a friend once say, statistics are like bikinis, what they reveal is suggestive, and what they hide is vital. And I'll just leave it. So nana ki a hoki. Mi haro, mi haro. Ka whai, whatsai mai, wha? Ko mai ko hau gina hau. Um, thanks for that information. I'm concerned you're talking about the white people who have no idea about this, and I'm not one of them. I'm an Irishman. Okay. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, that information you gave, you know, is, is convincing and real. Yeah. Um, are, are Labour going to do anything about um, informing New Zealanders <coughs> about the big choice that they're making, um, as far as you know? We, we need to make informed decision. This is an important one. Yeah. Um, so to go in blind into the ballot box without understanding what they're actually trying to achieve could be, yeah, that not good. Um, so are you going to get out there, maybe just exactly what you've done, and uh, maybe get on, get on TV? And, um, <laughs> <laughs> no, well, but, you know, it, it, it would be in New Zealand's right. interest, wouldn't it? Let's face it. Yeah, all right. And Thank you, Ewa. Yeah, and I don't mean to give the impression that I think Pākehā have no idea. No. Um, many Pākehā have lots of ideas and good ideas, and you know, essentially we do have to move forward on this kaupapa as a whole country, as a nation. I actually think that as, as Māori, we have such a leadership role in this particular referendum because we need to tell our stories about the current status quo and how discriminatory it is. So actually, if any, you know, any Māori person or any person who cares about Māori health and well-being would vote a certain way in the referendum next year. <laughs> and uh, thank you. In, in terms of the, um, the dissemination of good quality information, so I am part of the Prime Minister's Science Advisors Panel on cannabis and our very circumscribed job is to synthesize the evidence from a range of different uh, areas and Professor Doug Salmon who is here is also on the panel with me and 
we are to write a plain language, short, pithy, to the point, document. Believe me, I'm all about that because more than one page, I know, it's like, oh, next. So, so we, we have a real challenge, which is to synthesize the key points, the things that people really care about, like, I'm a teacher, I'm a mother, I'm a grandmother, I'm a cousin, I'm, um, you know, I'm a coach of a, of a team. All of us wear many different hats, and we, we care about, I think, particularly the health and well-being of our, of our tamariki mokapuna over generations and how this decision will impact on them. So our job is to write the very thing that you're talking about. I don't know that me going on television is going to make any difference at all. Um, that's very kind of you to say that. I think the better thing will be this document that will be like a one-pager to really, and there'll be, you know, you can go online and there will be things that you can drill down into and, and investigate and see the actual research papers. But essentially, it will be designed to help people make the right decision for them. Kia <laughs> ora um, thank you for your presentation. Um, we are seeing around the world uh, increasing incidence on admissions to ED for you know mental health presentations. Yes, I'm a GP and I am now working addictions. Mm. I see many GPs struggling with mental health disorders. Yeah. We are very under resourced mm -hmm. and we are struggling to cope and we are scared. Yeah. What would that mean to us? Mm. How are we going to support our population? We have seen people using cannabis um, from the age of 10, 15, you know, very yeah. early. So how can, what can we do yeah. to, if we go for yes, how can we avoid increasing those mental health conditions? Yeah. It means it's a cheaply question, important question. So I think there's a, there's a number of um, responses to that. Um, clearly, people in primary care are grossly under-resourced, manage a whole range of issues right now. There's been this great hope that primary care would, would take up a lot of care of mental health conditions, early... Um, early onset or prevention work, and the resources just haven't been there to help you people to do that. And also there are major barriers that prevent people like me getting more involved in supporting that kind of work and, and bridging those gaps and providing that high level, um, that high level, yeah, mentoring maybe, or information sharing. So one of the things that is going to be really important is the, not only the potential for change in legislation, but the regulatory framework around that and how taxation might help to provide the resources that are required to help you do the work that needs to be done. Uh, yes, there is some evidence in other parts of the world that there is an increase in use in the early phase, where in, in Canada I'm thinking in particular, and we need to watch and wait and see what happens with that. Um, the, the, I'm not sure that yeah, there'll be various opinions in the room, I'm sure, about how things have been handled in Canada, but I think we can learn from their mistakes. And my understanding is that there hasn't been a consistent, comprehensive approach to um, managing those sorts of interfaces, like what's, what are the needs in primary health care. So people are going to continue to use cannabis however we vote. Um, people are going to continue to have the, the problems, and this vulnerable 10% are going to continue to be there no matter how we vote. I think voting in a certain way, dependent on the regulatory framework that goes with that, should support better resourcing for people like yourself. How are we doing? Ooh. Maybe this is the last one? Yeah, uh, John Sales from the Deep South. Kia ora, um, John. Kia ora. Um, I've got a, a, a sort of a personal story a little bit with my grandson and he's been put on um, uh, CBD oil yep. for um, uh, severe autism and um, cerebral palsy traits mm. and absolutely magic results. Mm. My question is, are the government considering the application of CBD oil or cannabis extract for medical purposes at all. Thank you. 
So I'm not the government, so I can't answer on behalf of the government. Um, John, I have restricted my presentation to talking about what's loosely called recreational use, because that's the copa of the referendum. I think the medical uh, use of, of um, cannabis products is a whole other conversation. Uh, as a doctor, uh, I feel a strong duty of care and ethic towards making sure that people that I am working with and looking after have access to things that help them feel better and reduce pain and suffering. So um, that's my position. I am not licensed to, um, to prescribe uh, cannabis oil products at this point. Uh, but uh, that may change in the future. So at this stage, I, I'm not commenting on any, any further on the medical use of cannabis. And I think the government, from what my reading between the lines, is that they're trying to separate these issues to deal with the recreational use first in this way. We still have, we have some uh, capacity for access to the oil, but that that will come alongside after the decision next year. Nā mihi nui ki a koutou katoa, ki a kaha, ki a maia, ki a manawa nui, a ki a tō naki naki ki tō tātou mahi miharo, tō tātou mahi pai. Nā mihi nui. <laughs>